Yeah, my dad in the street against a heavyweight. I've gone back to the dad. I've punched him a few more times. Five blokes outside my front door. You coming out? One hell of a fucking story. So stay tuned. This is Omar Ahmed for IFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. We're in Abu Dhabi uh, to announce Bivol v Ramirez, November 5th, live on The Zone. But before that, um, you've done a partnership as well with, I believe, the culture or the Department of Culture and Tourism uh, with Abu Dhabi. So just talk to me about that in the series. Yeah, it's massive for, for us as a business. Um, obviously, boxing in the Middle East has been uh, growing. You've seen that with our recent events in Saudi and, and this one. You know, the first in, in line of our champion series out here in Abu Dhabi with DCT um, and building a long-term partnership of huge events in Abu Dhabi. So huge for us as a, a global promotional company. It's going to be a, a very active stop on our global schedule. Great partners, obviously, you've seen with the NBA, with Dana and, and UFC, um, F1. So huge for us and starting with a massive card on November 5th, of course. Great fight with Bivo against Zerdo Ramirez. Just seen Cordina Rakimov announced. Just announced Jessica McCaskill against Chantel Cameron for the Undisputed Championship. They're the first three fights. Gives you a flavour of what we're doing. Card of the year, November 5th, live on design. Speaking to Frank Smith off camera, and I think this is a very powerful move from Matram doing this because it's not just a one-off mm thing, which Saudi at the moment have been doing with the mega fights, but Frank Smith was saying about potentially Abu Dhabi looking at a five-year programme of yourselves and getting regular cards on. So, yeah, a powerful move for yourselves. Yeah, that was massive for us. You know, Abu Dhabi have a history of, of long-term associations. Again, you've seen that with UFC, NBA, all these guys, and that's um, the attractiveness of the deal for us, a long-term partnership with Abu Dhabi and a regular schedule of events, you know, building three, four, five events a year over that five-year period. Um, and the Champion Series will be the highest calibre events in boxing that will be held here in Abu Dhabi. And again, I think November 5th will be a good indication as to the level that we'll be operating in terms of the cards here. Um, and, you know, this is also a global sports hub, really, Abu Dhabi, in terms of the infrastructure, the setup. The Etihad Arena is sensational, which... Uh, fans will be in, in November 5th and, and building off the success that the UFC have had. Um, great team, great partnership and, and really excited for the future. We know the card is mainly UK based. The main event is more of an American fight. So what time will the fight be on Abu Dhabi time? The fight will, Abu Dhabi time will be around 1am main event. So you're looking at prime time UK, which is another attractiveness of doing shows in the Middle East. Um, earlier on in the day, for the US audience, of course, on the zone. Uh, but again, still a, a pleasant time, um, around 5, 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is great. So the time zones work well here. Um, the focus is not really UK cards in Abu Dhabi. It's a global appeal. And you see that with the multi-nationalities that will be on the card, of course. Uh, Dimitri Bivol and, and Rakimov and Cordina, McCaskill, Zerdo. So, and plenty more to come as well. That's the first three fights. It's going to be about eight or nine fights on this card and a lot more action. As I said, I, I really believe this will be the best card of the year. And of course, you wanted Joshua Boatsy to box Dimitri Bivol. Um, the WBA denied that, got Zerdo in as mandatory. Um, and then you wanted to make the Jean Pascal fight uh, with Boatsy. We know Lou DiBella won the purse mm. bid at $975,000. $100,000 above you. So a reaction to that, please? Yeah, disappointing for us, really. We wanted to win that bid. I mean, we were trying to get the key for that fight. And, you know, I don't want to point fingers at Jean Pascal, but obviously everyone knows his history of, of the failed ped tests. And we were trying to do a deal with his team because VADA testing is absolutely imperative for Joshua Boatsy in that fight. Um, and we'll be insistent on that. Or even though... Contractually, we can't be under a purse bid, so we have to go through that issue. I hope that Lou and John Pascal are willing to undergo full VADA testing in light of what happened recently. Every fighter should anyway. Um, and we'll, we'll push through with that and see if that fight happens. We want the fight to happen. We accept we lost the purse bid. It's not now, oh, we're pulling out because it's a good fight for Joshua Boatsy. Um, but we will be insistent on VADA testing. Uh, just get a comment on... Uh, the reports going around that Frank Warren and Beatty will stage that fight between Boatsy and Pascal. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, 
you know, I understand the game. I understand the politics. You know, you, you always want to invest in your own fighters and do shows with your own fighters. But if they're running out of their own fighters, it's a good move to try and get other big name fighters. So I understand the game. Um, I can't help still be baffled why we can't make Boatsy against Yard, in all honesty. Like, you know, I offered um, Yard seven figures for that fight, Sterling, and they turned it down. I'd still love to make that fight, but we're here with, with uh, Pascal, ready to make that fight, subject to full VADA testing, which is, is important to Joshua Boatsy and Virgil and the team. Um, we lost the bid fair and square. We bid 875, they bid 975. Ludabella and Frank Warren teaming up to win the bid. Bit random, but it's, it's the game. It's the game we're in. And uh, we can, you know, there's a big kind of a hardcore following for Persbid, isn't there, online. All I can say to you is, as a business, we'll always back our fighters, but we have to bid commercially what we feel the value of a fight is. And we'll overbid on times for our fighters, and we'll always put our hand in our pockets, but... When you lose a bid where you feel like you've, you've bid max money, it's a bit like, you know, if, you, if you're bidding on a house and you get outbid by a number that just sometimes doesn't make sense. I mean, you know, you look at the Ramirez uh, Progre bid yesterday. Uh, we didn't bid, but the bids were 1, 1.2 million and 2.4 million. And at that stage, you look at it and go, I think, wow, thank God I didn't bid because I wouldn't have bid anywhere near that number. So, um, you know, our, our job is to try and make sure Boatsy becomes mandatory for the world title or gets the world title shot. But would have much prefer if Frank Warren wants to put Boatsy on that we find a way to make Boatsy against Yard because it's five times the fight of Pascal against Boatsy. Um, but unfortunately, Yard didn't want the fight. Rumours have a world title shot against Better Beer in February, though. Yard, February, yeah, but when did he last fight? Lyndon Arthur was the back end of last year, but Better Behave is suffering an injury. Yeah, but then why not fight? And mate, mate, if you feel like you can beat Boatsy, make over a million quid. To That's fight. like saying for yourself, do Boatsy v Smith. They're both in world title positions. Well, I'd do that fight. Would you? No problem. Would you no pull him out of the Pascal fight? Yeah, of course, because that, that's, that's a fight to be. Yard is mandatory. We've got to have a fight to be mandatory. By the way, Callum Smith is also mandatory. So you've got the circle of... Uh, Yard, Smith and Boatsy. So Boatsy's got to wait for those three fights before he fights Better Behave anyway. So, but we like the fight. So um, we, I'd do Callum Smith against uh, Boatsy and we might do, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, Yard is going to be out or unless he fights late this year, which I guess he will. But for me, you know, if we received an offer for that kind of money or what we're prepared to pay, I think it would be difficult for Boatsy not to accept Okay, let's go back to Saudi Arabia. Um, watching it live in the arena, I think I had it 8 4 to Usyk. Watching it back on the television, I don't know if you have, I did have it wider to Usyk. Have you watched it back? It wider than 8 4? Yeah. Wow, okay, no. I haven't watched it back. I had Usyk by two rounds, three rounds. I think at the end of the ninth round, I had it pretty much all square. And I thought Josh was going to take control of the fight after the ninth. Then I had Usyk winning the last three rounds. So whether I had Josh shading it or all square after nine, Usyk. For me, 115, 113, 116, 112, mm, might be a bit harsh, but you know, those three rounds were, were huge in the fight and that those three rounds won him the fight. I mean, if you look at the cards, I don't agree with 115, 113 to Joshua, of course, but it was a close fight and the finish from Usyk is what won the fight. So, um, but I believe most people felt after the ninth round that AJ was gonna do the business after that round. but. The performance from Usyk in the championship rounds was sensational. Now, in terms of what happened after, appreciate Anthony Joshua as his own man. You're not Anthony Joshua, but you are his spokesperson. You've done, uh, you spoke about him in, in good moments, in bad moments before. So, yeah, I just want to sort of reflect on what happened after the fight. I think the overriding feeling was that it was Alexander Usyk's moment, mm -hmm. especially what was going on with Ukraine. He just retained his titles. And he didn't really get that moment in the ring until Joshua had left with Andy Scott and Sky. So your thoughts on that? I mean, if you if you watch back, the first thing that AJ did was go over, congratulate him, and hold the Ukrainian flag up behind him when they were announcing the winner. So people forget about that. Joshua has apologised for his actions. I'm not so sure whether he should, but he did, and he probably feels like he said some things he shouldn't have or reacted in ways that he shouldn't have. But there was an incredible amount of emotion and frustration. Um, 
you know, he left the ring because I think he felt like he was bubbling up with emotion and wanted to get out. And then he realised to himself, I actually have a responsibility to try and be gracious, come back in the ring. And, you know, I see a lot of, I'm not sure clown's the right word, but people saying, you know, someone should have gone over to Joshua and pulled him away. Mate, by the time he gets the mic, it's on him. And if, by the way, if you go over and try and get the mic off him, <laughs> it becomes 30 times worse because next thing, you're rolling around with him because he wasn't in the mood to mess around and, and start people snatching mics off him. So that's his moment, that's his platform. That, at that moment, as a man, as a woman, as an individual, it's on you, what you say. And I don't think he said anything bad. He just spoke from the heart with emotion and frustration. If he had his time again, I don't think he would have done it, but he did it, and that's it. So, you know, you saw the response at the press conference, more emotion, but obviously a chance to calm down and reflect. And, you know, some people always say, you know, oh, AJ's manufactured, he never, he's never real, he never speaks from the heart. Well, there you go. They, you, you get to see it. You get to see him raw. You get to see a guy with a huge amount of pressure on his shoulders. You get to see a guy who was desperate to win. You get to see a guy who dedicated the last 12 months to winning that fight and was emotionally and mentally broken and devastated that he lost in front of the world. And you, you saw it raw. Aside from the speech, um, the belts moment where he chucked them out of the ring, of course, the Usyk's belt. So again, a comment on that. I think it was more about the issues that we've had over the last few years with the governing bodies. It wasn't about losing the fight or Usyk shouldn't have the belts. It was probably more about thinking about the sanction fees that he's paid during that fight and the other fights and the amount of times we have mandatories put on us and not being able to make the fights we wanted to make or the dates we wanted to make. And now that's the most exciting thing about moving forward. Now he can be in charge of his own career and his own destiny. We can fight who we want, where we want, when we want, be as active as we want, whilst we're building up to get AJ a shot at the World Heavyweight title again. And that should be the most exciting thing for his career now. You know, a chance to actually be active and, again, build a schedule. I want, you know, I want to build a world tour. I want to see AJ fight in London, in Beijing, in Australia, in the Middle East, in America. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think he's really going to fall in love with the sport again. OK, I know you say about the belt disappearing, there's not going to be sanctioning fees, the pressure, etc. But you guys, yourself, Anthony, made a lot of money through those belts. Not really. I mean, you know, AJ made a lot of money because he's the biggest draw in boxing. The governing bodies made a lot of money out of Anthony Joshua. I mean, if you knew the sanction fees that were paid for that fight, you, you, you could not believe it. And I'm not saying that the governing bodies are wrong to charge sanction fees, but AJ didn't make the money out of the belts. AJ made the money out of being a draw and being a fighter, a, a, a fighter that people wanted to watch. So, of course, he wants to be world heavyweight champion. This isn't a fuck the belts moment. This is, that was a frustration moment to say, these belts you know, have set me back in my tracks. They've made me overpay opponents, take fights that you know, other people wouldn't have fought. But you know, no excuses, he shouldn't have done it, and that's why he apologised. But I'm excited for him to be without the belts and to build a schedule and to learn in the gym and improve and get cracking on the road again. Can you give me some names that he could box then? Not really, because then it's like, speculation and people want to put the money up and like he's going to fight a top 15 guy you know the fight that I want the fight that he wants is Dillian White and that's the biggest fight it's not going to happen in December but it's a massive stadium fight next year the first one was epic the second one will be even better um, Deontay Wilder is that realistic? one of the biggest fights in boxing it's realistic because someone's going to pay a lot of money for that fight um but, you know, I, was, I reach out to their team and don't really hear anything back. So it's difficult to know whether there can be progression because of the history of, of trying to make that fight. But, you know, the Dillian fight is a fight that is a must-make and will make. Um, and the one in December will be a top 15 guy. Um, someone that AJ can go in and be challenged against but can in, show his improvements and get active. And that's the key. A lot of concern about Anthony's mental state. Of course, the public looking in at that moment would be. Um, so there has been suggestions, especially from Simon Jordan, saying that he should take a break from boxing rather than getting him out in December. Good old Simon Jordan. 
and he always knows best. He's actually very good, Simon Jordan. But I think people are right to be concerned, but people around him, you know, no one's putting any pressure on Anthony Joshua to box again. Trust me, the worst thing for AJ now is to go and have a huge spell of inactivity because physically he wants to fight. Mentally, he's getting over the defeat. He still has four or five weeks till he's got to get back into camp. He wants to be active. And the only person that will make a decision about him fighting in December is him. From my side, it's if you feel you're ready, I think it's a good idea. And every conversation, including yesterday, was we're going in December. But we'll see because, as you know, as, as you see with fighters, after a big occasion, a fighter was always posting on Instagram on the road in the gym, back to it, back to it. And then from an adrenaline point of view, you fall off a cliff. Now he hasn't fallen off a cliff. I feel like actually the meltdown, if that's what you want to call it, was good for him. Because I think it got a lot out of the system rather than just holding it in. You know, and, that, and that's a message as well to people who are struggling or have going through an emotional time or are under pressure. You've got to let it out. You've got to talk to people. And if you do, you'll feel a million times better. Now, that wasn't AJ in the room telling someone, that was AJ in front of the world telling people. And I feel off the back of that, the messages that he's had of support have been massively encouraging to him. Of people saying, wow, like, you know, I'm struggling too and you just imploded in front of the whole world. So if you can do it, I can do it. If I can come back from it, you can. And, and I, th I just feel that that's going to help him. That pressure has been, it's almost like the lid's come off and it's been released. But it's too early to say to give you a definite answer for December. But all I can tell you is right now, the plan is to fight in December. And I can't wait to see it. Now on the night, you weren't happy that Tyson Fury took to Instagram and was talking about the fight. Um, I guess people could argue they've been rivals. He wasn't really talking around the fight. He was laughing about the fight. And, you know, but listen, people have got to understand that everyone's entitled to their opinion. And people should be an allowed an opinion. But I just, you know, I, I just see it sometimes as, as fake, you know. If you've been through these times that you talk about and you see someone going through tough times in front of your eyes, I just feel that you'd be a little bit more empathetic and sympathetic. Now, if you're rivals and you don't like him and you want to go to him and laugh at his own expense, I get that too. Sometimes it, it works both ways. But... I just feel like if you're seeing someone go through a situation that maybe it wasn't the same as yourself, but you saw signs that it might be similar, you might be a little bit more empathetic, but maybe we're in the wrong game. You know, it was, and it was so instant, you know, it was, you know, but it's boxing and there's a lot of uh, emotion for every way. So, yeah, it's just, I think it's difficult, in my opinion, not to find or not to give encouragement to someone like Anthony Joshua in that moment. But, as you say, they're rivals. OK, we expect that fight between Fury and Usyk to happen. I just want to read a quote um, from Frank Warren about you picking Alexander Usyk to beat Tyson Fury. So this was, I believe, to the Daily Star. Um, he said, Deontay Wilder would beat Tyson, Dillian would beat Tyson, Anthony Joshua would KO Usyk twice. His predictions are about as good as hemorrhoids would be for Frankie. Hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids. That's the condition downstairs, yeah, isn't it? When, when Frank, yeah. for Frankie Dettori, horse rider. Uh, thoughts on Frank's comments? Terrible gag. I mean, I've, I've noticed lately some of his lines are awful. Um, promoter backs his own fighter to win, shock. You know, I mean, the amount of times that Frank Warren's back, backed his own fighter to win and not won, and I'm not, obviously I back my own fighters at all time, but genuinely I, I believed that Dillian White could beat Tyson Fury. I believed that AJ could knock out Usyk. Um, Maybe sometimes you're emotionally invested, but other times you believe it in, in a boxing sense as well. So, yeah, unfortunately, I don't know how many fights I've been involved with. 20,000. I've definitely got some wrong. And I definitely won't stop backing my fighters, but I just hope that he can improve his gags. Awful. Also, his one's on Frank Smith as well. Awful. But, you know, it's, too, those like, it's not even dad jokes, is it? It's like great-granddad jokes. Um, I do the dad jokes, they're terrible, but his ones are awful. Thoughts on him saying also that Matram are now out of the heavyweight picture? 
we've got, uh, listen, I still believe we have the biggest draw in the division. If he's not the biggest draw in the division, he's the second biggest draw in the division. Um, we also work with Dillian White. We've got the mandatory challenger for the world heavyweight title, Philip Hergovic. He's probably forgotten about that one as well. Um, even Zile Zhang. You know, great fight. We've got Derek Chisora still rumbling on. We've got Dempsey McKean, top 10 in the world, heavyweight from Australia. We've got, we're plenty invested in the heavyweight division, but some people just focus on us and me. And unfortunately for Frank, he's been like that for 10 plus years. Um, you know, I've not paid rent in that mind for 12 or 13 years. And, um, I've, you know, I've been a pleasant tenant, but I guess I'm not going to leave the brain anytime soon. How much do you think Saudi Arabia will pay Fura Nusik to stage it? A lot of money, you know, of course. That, that's always been the, the aim for them is to stage the undisputed championship. What does Tyson Fury want? Half a billion well, he ain't, getting that, he ain't getting anywhere near that kind of money. So maybe he doesn't take the fight. I'm not so sure he does. You know, I, I think... You said this about Wilder, though, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't think he'd take the fight, but that was a, a little bit different. He's achieved a lot more now. But look, if he's a man of his word, which we all know he isn't, then half a billion, or he's not fighting, there you go. He ain't fighting, because he ain't getting half a billion. Nowhere near. You know what he's doing, though. He's just negotiating with different governments to get a higher price. You know what he's doing. He's not negotiating with any governments. He's given a price and he says he won't box for a penny less. Okay. Thoughts on the fight itself? You actually think Usyk yeah, I, beats him? By the way, some people put up clickbait. My line the other day was, I don't think it's a very entertaining fight, but I think it's an intriguing fight. I don't believe that their style was going to make for a great fight, but I think it's very intriguing. You've got two geniuses in the ring, two tremendous fighters. No one puts that bit up when they, give, they put my quotes up. Um, I, just, I just think Usyk's very, very difficult to beat, and I give him the edge. But I've written Tyson Fury off many times, and he's proved me wrong, as Frank said with his hemorrhoids gag. Um, and, yeah, I... I Love to watch it. And it's going to crown the undisputed heavyweight champion. So I really hope it happens. Okay. Just to go back to AJ, a quote from Robert Garcia uh, came out. I think Anthony's mind is a bit weaker than Usyk's. Instead of going out stronger, his mind and exhaustion played games with him. He, he took... He it, did withdraw in the comments. Well, because it, it was a translation from Spanish. I think at the end of the day, yeah, I think, I think Usyk's mind is stronger than AJ's. I think that's fair to say. And from a boxing sense, I think the guy had 400 amateur fights. He's undisputed at Cruiser. I mean, he's, he's been boxing since he was about six. So, yeah, there's no there's no shame in that. Um, and AJ, I felt, when they went back to their stalls at the end of the ninth round, I felt AJ was going to win the fight. So, um, you know, Robert's going to have his opinions and so would everybody else. But on we go. Eddie, what did you think of Robert Garcia and Angel Fernandez during the fight? 10 and AJ, he was up. And the same thing happened in the first fight at Tottenham. Well, I think there was an argument he was up in the, first, in the second fight. Certainly not in the first fight, at no point. I mean, unless it's after the early rounds where it might be close. But um, there was an argument he was up after the ninth round. Some people did have him up after the ninth round. Um, I haven't watched it back to see what was said in the corner. But these guys are experienced people, experienced trainers. Um, I don't know what was said in 10, 11, 12, but... Again, like the brilliance of Alexander Usyk won that fight in the championship rounds. Lastly, because you've got to go, just to close off, of course, Joshua's pledged his long-term future to, to DAZN from his next fight onwards. Um, after the fallout in the ring, has DAZN said anything about, about what happened, about the loss? Um, yeah, what have they said? I think the intrigue in Anthony Joshua's career through that moment is a lot bigger than it would have been if he just waltzed off into the sun. People want to see how he's going to come back. People want to see him come back with strength. The support has been incredible. He's still the biggest draw in the division, in my opinion. Maybe I'm wrong. Bigger than Fury? I believe so, globally. I mean, I've seen the numbers. Like, they're off the scale. Um, everywhere we go. But if, if he's not the biggest draw in the division, he's number two. So it ain't a bad place to be, is it? And does own have the first or second biggest draw in the heavyweight division? And we look forward to some massive nights for him on the zone. And the next one will be announced probably sooner than we think. So just quickly, you think after that third loss, his stock's gone up? I think his stock went up in that fight. I think with the reaction, with the controversy, with the performance, 
I think his stock went up in that fight. If you fight in the pound for pound number one and you're giving him a great fight, and it, it, your stock doesn't have to always go down. People have got to be scared to be in these great fights because they're scared of their stock falling. But I don't see his stock changing. I think it went up in that fight, in all honesty. And people are going to be very intrigued to see what happens next in the career of Anthony Joshua. And in my opinion, get ready for the most exciting part yet. Thanks for your time, Edit. Yeah, I put my dad in the street against a heavyweight. I've gone back to the dad. I've punched him a few more times. Five blokes outside my front door. Can you come and help One hell of a fucking story, so stay tuned.